Good morning, Virginia. This is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial. Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.15. This is Story Time brought to you by Safe Haven Ministries. I am your host, Brother D. As always, let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for our many blessings. Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling today. Please keep them safe. Father, we are grateful for waking us up this morning. We are grateful for all of our safe travels thus far. Father, we are grateful for the greatest gift you ever gave the world, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Duh, Brother D, I know what we're going to do today. You do, dog. How do you know what we're going to do today? Because even I wasn't sure. Duh, I was looking over your shoulder when you were marking stuff in the book. Well, I'm glad you were, uh, but I still didn't know what I was going to be doing. Duh. Well, I got one for you, Brother D. You, 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 you marked a spot in the book, and I read it and everything. And it, it's about biology and everything. You know, one of the most fascinating and unique creatures of all creation is the common hummingbird. What it, what is the probability that all the unique characteristics of this ruby-throated hummingbird, each of which is needed for the survival? The, for its survival, developed by some step-by-step -step evolutionary process. A few of the hummingbird's incredible abilities are listed and everything, and I'm going to read them to you, Brother D. The first, the unique ability to fly forward, backward, upside down, and straight up like a helicopter as no other bird can. You're right, dog, that is a unique ability. Uh, number two, the use of a special fringe tongue to sweep insects out of the inside of flowers and everything. You know, it cannot survive on nectar alone, but also needs a protein from eating the insects and everything. And without the special tongue, it would never catch the insects. You're right, dog. That's another unique ability. And here's one that a lot of people don't think about. The hummingbird has the ability to fly 500 miles nonstop over the Gulf Coast waters and everything to Mexico. The hummingbird can conserve its strength for long period, for these long flights by taking a prolonged rest just before the flight and, and, and making every motion count in flight and, and everything. And, you know, they, they, God give them such a unique ability and everything. You're right, dog. And I meant they take, take advantage of the trade winds and everything else. So, you know, that, that shows once again that we have a good creator who thought of everything. Uh, yeah. And they also have ability to go into a torpid condition, you know, at night and everything. Okay, dog, there will be people who don't know what a torpid condition is. Uh, well, that's where uh, at night they, they, they almost shut down. It, it, it starts by almost shutting completely down its metabolism. And because of this incredibly high energy activity and everything, gram for gram, the hummingbird has the greatest energy output of any warm-blooded animal. Yet at night, it only uses about one-fifth of its normal energy. That's right, dog. That makes the hummingbird a truly great marvel of God's creativity, doesn't it? Duh, it is. It's a marvel of God's creativity, Brother D, and everything. And the verse I got for you is from Psalm 105, uh, verses 4 and 5. Look. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done. His miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You're right, dog. That's one of the many things. But you stop and think. That hummingbird has a unique ability. And it's a very unique thing. But you know something? There's an insect out there that looks similar to the hummingbird. Duh. The, you're talking about the hummingbird insect. I saw one of them the other day. They, they look like a very miniature hummingbird, but but they also look something like a, a, a bumblebee who's been worked on by Dr. Frankenstein in some ways when you see them just barely, barely hovering. Well, but you stop and think. God created that little insect as well and gave it a very unique ability just like he did the hummingbirds. And everything. And you'll see them together on the same flowers, on the same trees. You know, it, it's amazing what God has done. Duh, yep. And 
You, you know, that that's one of those things, Brother D. Well, stop and think about this. I'm going to talk about a little anatomy here. The eye is an incredibly complex organ that moves 100,000 times in an average day. Numerous muscles and tear ducts are in place to keep the eye constantly moist, protected, and functional. Did you know our eyes process 1.5 million bits of information simultaneously and provide 80% of the sensory stimulation sent to the brain? Duh, I didn't know that. Well, they receive light images traveling at 186,000 miles per second through the iris, which opens and closes just to let, to let in just the right amount of light. These images travel through the lens made of a transparent cells which focuses them on the retina at the back of the eyeball. Now the retina covers less than one square inch of surface, yet this square inch contains approximately 137 million light-sensitive receptor cells. Duh, that's a lot, Brother D. Well, approximately 130 million are rod cones. They're designed specifically to see black and white. And 7 million are cone cells, which allow for our color vision. Finally, the image is sent at a rate of 300 miles per hour to the brain for processing. How could all this have come, by, come about by step-by-step, -step, random chance evolutionary process? Duh, it just couldn't. Because mankind has designed and patterned their cameras after the eye, Brother D. That's right, dog. It is only, re it is only remarkable to acknowledge that the eye, which is infinitely more complex instrument than a camera, was also designed by intelligence. It, it, you, it's only reasonable. It's, it's remarkable that they think that the eye developed one step at a time. But you stop and think how it functions. It has to have a creator. It had to be designed by intelligence. Duh, yep. And Proverbs 20 verse 12 says, The ears that hear and the eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. That's right, though. God has done a great job. He's, he shows himself in all his creativity. And he shows us that he's a loving God. Duh, yep. And, and I, that's one of the things, Brother D. Well, you know what time it is now, dog. Duh, yeah, it's time for Pastor Brian in Chapter 6 of Book 1, High on Adventure. And here comes Pastor Brian. If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music he hears, however measured or far away. Throw. I am again in a nose dive, nose down dive. Only this time, I am in the sky over the Hawaiian Islands, doing 140 miles per hour without an airplane. The helicopter I jumped out of is a thousand feet above me as I hurl through the night sky. Beneath me, I see moonlit dancing on the rippling surface of the Pacific Ocean. At 35,000 feet, I pull the ripcord and Instantly feel the bite of nylon straps going snug as the parachute deploys above me. Then all is quiet, but for the rustling of wind rushing through my canopy as I slowly drift across the star-filled sky. Looking back down toward the water, I see the twin wakes of the two black zodiacs speeding in my direction. I activate a strobe light on my boot to aid their picking me up once I hit the dark water. This nighttime parachute operation is a standard part of our ongoing frogman training. Every three months, we are required to make a night jump into the ocean. Maintaining our jump qualifications is one of the more fun aspects of this exciting job. Suddenly, I notice there is something not quite right with the pickup boats. I can tell that they are speeding in my direction, but they seem to be falling behind, which is very surprising considering these boats are extremely fast. Looking more closely at the ocean surface, I realize I'm not looking at moonlight dancing on the water as much as it is lunar light reflecting off the wind, frothing, wind froth of whitecaps. 
Glancing back at the shoreline of Oahu, I realize there is a strong wind blowing and it is hurling me straight out to sea. For a heart-stopping moment, I consider the possibility of being lost in an empty ocean at night. The word shark even flutters through my thoughts as thoughts an instant before my feet hit the water. A half second later, I'm jerked back out of the water as my parachute, which is still full of wind, races straight out to sea. I am skimming across the surface, bouncing from white cap to white cap, face down. Salt water is shoveling up my nose at an appalling rate. I am in threat of drowning from nasal ingestion. Reaching desperately for a cap well, I trigger it, which releases one set of shroud lines. The wind spills from the parachute and the canopy collapses, which is good until it falls over my head. Because it's not easy to breathe under wet nylon, I desperately begin working my way toward the edge of the parachute. When I finally come up for air, for a breath of air, one of the speeding zo zodiacs narrowly misses me, misses running over me. As the other frogmen pull me into the inflatable boat, I think next time I jump out of an airplane, I will ask the pilot to check the wind velocity first. But not paying attention to my environment, by not paying attention to my environment, I could have made a fatal mistake. For a moment, I remember a high school friend who took a dare to jump off a cliff into a river swimming hole. The other kids incorrectly assumed that he knew about the underwater rock that they naturally avoided. That one foolish mistake, a brief moment of inattention and bad judgment, has placed him in a wheelchair for life. As the saying goes, look before you leap. Duh, we want to thank Pastor Brian for these stories and everything, and he, he thanks you all for your prayers and everything. That's right, Doug. We're grateful that Pastor Brian's still able to join us, even if it's through us having to record his stories to play later on. Now then, let's get on with our program and everything. Let's talk a little bit about physics. Duh, physics, uh, Brother D. You know science is not my best. Well, that's just it, dog. We're going to be doing a lot of science here and everything, but it's all God's creation. So this is a good thing. Duh, okay. If you're going to talk physics, what are you going to talk about? Well, did you know there's a little publicized fact of radiocarbon dating that <laughs> is is that all organic matter has a background level of radiation. Duh, I'll say that again, Brother D. It's a little publicized fact that those that are doing radiocarbon dating is that all the organic matter being tested has a background level of radiation. To understand this incredible implications of this fact, you must understand how radiocarbon carbon dating works. As nitrogen in our upper atmosphere is bombarded by cosmic rays, some of it is turned into radioactive carbon-14 molecules, which are uniformly dispersed throughout all living things. Once an organism dies, it stops taking in carbon-14. It begins to deteriorate at a rate of 50% every 5,730 years. Now, a million years later, there could not be a single atom of carbon-14 remaining. Radio or radiocarbon labs have found that essentially every previously living organi organic molecule has approximately point oh yeah it's point three percent of C14 that we find in today's atmosphere. Coal, natural gas, oil, shells, even unfossilized dinosaur bones still have measurable levels of C14. At the known C14 de deterioration rate for that 0.3% of C14 to be left in the organic molecules, they must be less than 46,000 46, years old. They could not possibly be millions of years old. 
You see, radiocarbon experts have taken extreme measures to eliminate all possible sources of modern contamination, yet they have been totally unsuccessful in eliminating this inherent C14. The implication is staggering. Since radiocarbon is still present in every buried organic molecule, which <laughs> you stop and think all of which are assumed to be many millions of years old, these molecules must have been alive quite recently. This inescapable conclusion from the data collected from radiocarbon labs around the world is not publicized because scientists are trained to believe that the Earth is billions of years old. And you stop and think, if, if everything works like they say it's supposed to work, there should be no carbon-14 left in their dinosaur bones. Yet, it's still there. It's minuscule, but it shows that it couldn't be millions or billions of years old. Duh, yep, and that's one of the things. And First Timothy 1 4 says, Instruct people not to occupy themselves with myths and endless uh, genealogies that promote speculation rather than the divine training. That's right, dog. That's one of the many things. Now, you stop and think about this. Stars are thought to have taken millions of years to form after purported Big Bangs viewed matter through the expanding universe. Now, according to current theory, stellar evolution, a star. Uh, the current theory of stellar evolution of star goes through several stages. First, under the effects of gravity, gas molecules supposedly come together until they ignite a nuclear reaction in the star's interior. No one really understands how this could happen and everything, or how it can happen. Next, the star burns brightly for hundreds of millions of years before expanding into a red giant. Eventually, this red giant slowly collapses to form a white dwarf. Sirius B is a star that is said to be a white dwarf star. Sirius B is a huge mystery for those who believe the accepted theory of stellar evolution. Uh, you mean that it takes millions of years for all this process to happen. That's right, dog, because stop and think about this. Egyptian astronomers in 2000 B.C. and the Roman senator Caesario in 50 B.C. described Sirius as a red star. Other ancient writers called Sirius B more red than Mars. One of the most famous astronomers in history, Ptolemy, in 150 AD, listed Sirius as one of six red stars. Now, there can be no question that Sirius was red. Yet, today, Sirius B has become, become classed as a white dwarf star. Now, according to modern evolutionary assumptions, it would take at least 100,000 years for a red giant to collapse into a white dwarf star. And it is still hotly debated how the giant, the red giant Sirius B became a white dwarf in less than 2,000 years. Sirius B signs, shines forth as a beacon, casting doubt on the most basic theories of stellar evolution and the gradual formation of our universe. Uh, yeah, I believe the Big Bang was uh, God said and it happened. And that's right, dog. That's how I believe too. But, you know, that's one of those things. And Isaiah 48, verse 13 says, My own hand laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summon them, they shall stand up together. Uh, yep, yeah, we serve a great God, don't we, brother? D? That's right, dog, we do. We serve a really great God. And that's one of the things. And this is where a lot of folks have real problems with it. Now, we're going to keep on with some astronomy and everything. Evolutionary science believe that matter spewed from exploding stars was used to form planets. They teach that the solar system and the sun formed from this great cloud of compacting gas. Yet they have no, they have no undisputed explanation for why Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury do not have the same high percentage of hydrogen and helium as our sun and, and the rest of the visible universe. Less than 1% of these planets are composed of hydrogen and helium. Now how could this be? Given the current prevailing theory that our solar system is a result of a condensing cloud of hydrogen gas, how could 99.86% of the mass within our solar system, our sun, be made of hydrogen and helium while the four planets closest to the sun are composed almost entirely of heavier elements. Duh. Something's got to be seriously wrong with the theory of the solar system evolution, Brother D. 
That's right. Something is seriously wrong with the theory of the solar system evolution, which is being taught to our children as if it were a fact. This is one of the things. When you start talking about evolution, there's a lot of things that if it don't go with what they're teaching, they, they conveniently ignore it. Duh, oh man, and everything. Uh, Psalm 148, verses uh, 4 and 5 says, Praise Him, your highest heavens and your waters above the sky. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. That's right, dog. That's one of the things. But you stop and think about how people go on. But this is how this is how things work. People don't want to hear the truth, so they conveniently ignore it. But how can you ignore the truth, Brother D? That that's the thing. You you stop and think. You, if you don't pay attention to the truth, what what good does it do you to study anything? Well, that's just it, though. People have had it indoctrinated into them. You know, evolution is a scientific fact. But it's not. It's not been proven. That's why the scientists out here are still looking for their missing links and everything else. Duh, uh, oh, man, I, you, you, you got something else, don't you, Brother D? That's right. <laughs> this one comes from a... It's called a fossil record and everything. Class is talking about this. The evolutionists use the presence of certain extinct animal remains to date rock layers that contain this particular fossil. For example, a certain type of mollusk called a polina was believed to be extinct for some 400 million years, leaving no more recent remains in the fossil record. However, in 1952, a virtually identical mollusk was found alive and well living at ocean depths of 12,000 feet. Duh, oh man, the pressure there is so great. That's right, Doug. This shows that the living fossil, as it is called, hasn't evolved over the supposed 400 million year period because the modern specimens look exactly like their 400 million year old ancestors. How can an organism which is still alive be used to date rock layers? Evolutionists just throw out this index fossil but continue to use others. The contradictions of evolution compound themselves in endlessly. Now, here's here's another example. Uh, I'm going to murder this word, but uh, a co-laugh camp is another example of a fossilized animal which supposedly became extinct, leaving no fossils for the past 60 million years. Yet, many living coliths have are identical to the fossilized remains, which are supposedly 60 million years old, have been caught in the Indian Ocean since 1938. And the evolutionists have no adequate explanation for this. These types of living fossils are simply created similar to their present form and have never changed. The worldwide flood is an event that created a majority of the fossil records, not billions of years of slow burial. Duh, that's the thing. It, Folks just don't want to get it, do they, Brother D? No, they don't, dog. That's the whole problem. Folks don't want to get it. But, you know, Genesis verse 1, 20, or excuse me, Genesis 1, verses 20 and 21. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing which the water teems according to their kinds. Oh, man, you, you, you stop and think about that, Brother D. And everything, and you know, people say you can't trust the Bible, but you, I got one for you, and everything. What's that, dog? Well, you see, there are people who will tell you that the, the Bible can't be trusted. It doesn't. It, it goes against science and everything else. But you know, the Bible the Bible supports science because science science comes from God. That's right, dog. Without God, there would be no science. And everything. So what do you got for us? Duh, well, you stop and think about this. In Ezekiel uh, chapter 26, verses 3 through 21, specific predictions were made against the city of Tyre. The prophecy stated that the city would be destroyed as many nations would come against it. It was predicted that Tyre would be made bare as the top of a flat rock and that fishermen would spread their nets over their side. <laughs> the walls and the towers would be destroyed and the Debris would be scraped clean and tire would be left barren and everything. And you stop at that, Brother D. In the Bible, this very specific prediction was made at the height of tire's power and importance. 
and everything. And three years after the prophecy was given, Nebuchadnezzar laid a 13-year siege on mainland Tyre. When he finally entered the city, he found that most of the people had moved to an island a half a mile off the coast and everything. And they had fortified a city on that island with powerful walls reaching to the very edge of the sea and everything. But over 200 years later, Alexander the Great laid siege and everything to the island city of Tyre. And, and since he had no fleet, he demolished the old city of Tyre and, and everything. And he cast the debris into the sea and he built a 200 foot wide causeway out to the island and everything. And by doing this, Alexander was able to move his army across the land bridge and destroy the island city and everything. That's right, dog. And Tyre's history doesn't end there, does it? Uh, no, it doesn't. Eh? And everything. Many subsequent attempts that were made to rebuild Tyre, but sieges always destroyed the city. And today, both the original city and the island city are bare rocks where fishermen can be seen drying their nets. You stop and think, Brother D. The accuracy of the Bible prophecy is undeniable evidence of the Bible's authenticity and everything. You're right, dog. And that's one of the things. And Ezekiel 26, it says, I will bring many nations against you. That's, and it says, they will destroy the walls and they will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. I am going to bring Nebuchadnezzar. They will throw your stones and rubble into the sea. I will make you a bare rock, a place to spread fish nets. You will never be rebuilt, for the Lord has spoken. And that's the thing. You stop and think. People don't want to hear what the Bible's got to say, but God has always got something for us to read and to understand. Duh. That's one of the things, Brother D. You know, you you were talking about you don't you, you don't have a problem with science. You have a problem with the folks who don't follow the facts, don't you? That's right, dog. I love science. Science is a great thing. Without science, you wouldn't have many of the things we have today. But when you ignore the scientific facts because they don't go with your theories, something's wrong with your science. That's one of the things. Now, you stop and think about this. You ever think about your anatomy? Duh. What do you mean, Brother D? Well... There are more than 600 muscles containing 6 billion muscle fibers in the human body. They make up about 40% of your body's weight. Now, some muscles are voluntary, like the muscles of the arms and the legs. In other words, you have to think to move these types of muscles. Now, other muscles, like your heart and the intestines, are involuntary. Duh. Uh, you, you mean that their, their contraction and, and relaxation of these muscles cannot be consciously controlled. That's right, dog. You know, you can hold your breath for a little bit, but your body's going to make you breathe whether you want to or not. That, you know, the abdomen is a, your abdominal muscles and your diaphragm are both involuntary and voluntary, but you can't control it but for so long and everything. But, you know, you stop and think. Frequently, muscles work in pairs. For example, the biceps in the upper arm pulls the forearm up whereas the tricep moves the forearm down. This perfect design allows one muscle to rest while the other muscle is being used. Each muscle has its own stored supply of high-grade fuel made from food which the body converts into usable sugars. The muscle system also works together with other systems like the nervous system and skeletal systems. The nerve connections are required to signal muscles as to when to contract or relax Without a doubt, their cooperative nature was planned. Now, Webster's Dictionary defined this. Design as, it, it defines design as deliberate, purposeful planning. I repeat, deliberate, purposeful planning. Just looking at the interaction between muscles and the rest of our body parts, how can anyone help but conclude that we have a designer? Duh. Yep, God designed us perfectly, didn't he, Brother D? That's right. Some people may not think that, but Psalms 119, verses 72 says, Your hands made me and formed me. This is one of the things. God made us, and he made us all in his image. We may not be perfect in our minds, but God knows us so well. He knows every hair on our head. And 
Duh. Yeah, and, and for you, for you starting to be a little physically challenged in you, in your old age, brother D. Dog, I ain't as bad as my one of my brothers or a few other people I know, but God still knows everything about me. Duh. Yeah, and that's a good thing, brother D. And you need to look at the time. You're right, dog. Let us end with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you once again for a beautiful day. We thank you for waking us up this morning. Father, we lift up the firefighters, the EMTs, the doctors, nurses, the law enforcement officers, those first responders that work tirelessly to keep us safe. Father, as always, we lift up our armed forces, the men and women who protect us so that we may worship you as we see fit. Be with their families, Father. Father, we are grateful for all that you've given us this past week, and we ask as we get ready to start this new week, please be with us, help us to go forward, to be a blessing to all we meet. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, folks, if you like what you hear on the radio, you can call us at 434-390-5981. That, that's 434-390-5981. That's right, folks. Or you can email us at emtx3xl at gmail.com. Again, that is emtx3xl at gmail.com. Folks, once again, we like to remind everybody, WGFW is a Christian radio station. You hear no advertising on this radio station. It depends upon you solely for its support. Please send your donations to God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia 24531. Again, that's God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia 24531. Now, folks, we also want to thank you all at Safe Haven Ministries for keeping us on the air and everything. We're grateful you kept us on the air for the last seven years. That's right, Doug. Once again, folks, this is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial, Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 946. We return you to the regular broadcast. Duh, folks, may your week be blessed.